On Saturday night, they were encouraging the teens to come out. They were loud. <laughs> they were rocking. I mean, they were really loud. It was so funny because I was, I was kind of hanging in the back, just talking to some folks and just kind of checking things out. And people started rolling out and leaving. I was like, man. So I was intercepting them in the foyer. Hey, you guys aren't leaving, are you? Well, yeah, for now. <laughs> we'll be back. I said, oh. So they weren't like leaving, leaving. They were just going outside. It was the funniest thing. These guys were up there, and I mean, they were just, no. I mean, the teens were just bouncing, and I didn't have much of a clue of what anybody said, but... <laughs> <laughs> the old folks were in the foyer and the older folks were in the parking lot it's true I'm not making it up I'm telling you the truth the foyer was packed with like middle aged folks and the oldest folks were out in the cars and bless their hearts they said we're going to go out and pop in a worship CD we'll be back in later it's a true story so we went out in the foyer and I thought people were leaving so I'm running out like, guys, because I just, you just knew, you know, we're going to preach the gospel. God's going to be there. You know, it's not word only, it's demonstration of power. And it turned out that that was probably the most free-flowing grace night, if that's a good, the, the grace of God was so there. Like it didn't matter who was praying for who, that's the way it ought to be, who knows this is the body of Christ, just slow and in grace. And God was, just, ooh, ooh, ooh. there were so many healings, it was phenomenal. But it was on that night, it was cool. But an usher went out into the parking lot. I'm not making this up. And he's like, he's doing everything. Cars started open, it looked like everybody just got there. It was so funny. But we went out in the foyer. I ran out there because I wanted to keep people from leaving. And I was like, please don't leave. And they said, well, we're, we're hanging. We, we want to stay. We know the, we just, we're looking forward to you guys speaking and ministering. And, and, uh, so we're not leaving. We're just waiting until this is over. It was just fun. But I appreciated that because they could have had a different attitude. And they could have went home. And, uh, but we were out in the foyer and just started figuring, you know what? God like doesn't wait till a certain time in the service to be God. So we just started loving on people and praying in the foyer. There were so many things happening in the foyer. People were getting healed and crying. There was words flowing. I turned around, Todd come out in the foyer and it got worse. It was just because <laughs> he come out there and went, Ooh, people. <laughs> He saw people. It was funny. And, 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 and it was funny because, I don't know, he's got some kind of short leg attracting anointing or something. I said to him, I said, I never saw anything so crazy. Everywhere I go with him, there's he finds somebody with a short leg. And I'm like, I said, you know, I think I'm just going to go walking up to people saying, hey, you got a short leg because the way I'm seeing odds, I'm going to be right more than I'm wrong. It's crazy. I've never even realized it. But this lady, he says, "Hun, I need you to come here and sit in this chair. She's like, okay. <laughs> Sits in the chair. He said, you've got a short leg. She said, I've had a short leg my whole life. She said, my mother would hem my pants differently as a young, growing up as a young girl. He said, oh, this is going to be so cool. So he pulls the legs, and most of you, you know, know the story from there on. But her friend's standing there like this. <laughs> he's watching because he's got the same thing his whole life and they're friends he's watching because he has the same thing and he's not sure about all this he thought this is good she can go first I'll watch it's so funny when God moves because he's holding her feet up and she's got these long heels on anyway and she didn't have a built up shoe it was short enough to think she'd have had an added sole it was short it was really short came right out she does a little squeal and says, oh my God, I feel that in my hip. And he's like this. He's looking up at Todd. He's looking up at Todd. As soon as she stands up, he says, check out your feet. He said, I'm next. Not right in the chair. Didn't have to coax him anymore. Just poof. He's watching with his eyes and he goes, whoa. Boop, he's in the seat. He's next. Of course, you know the rest of that story too. So we got them up and shared. But that night was so fun because 
people started singing stuff like you, you the worship team was surrendering and singing stuff like that at the end. And you know, people we weren't praying for a lot of folks right then. We just it was almost like a your heart before the Lord kind of order setting without having an order call. We didn't have an order call, it just kind of turned into one. And you can feel everybody's heart go like this. And when they did like this, Spirit of God was just there. It was so fun. So, you know, because you're traveling, you're speaking, you're standing there, and they, you know, you're preaching word of the church, and you're getting people involved all week, but it still never fails. They, they bring their friends to you. But you're standing up front, and there's like, tap, and they got their friend there. You know, on this side, tap, and there's their friend. Can you pray? And usually I'll get people, I'll say, come here, pray, pray, because you don't want them to think it's, it's just you or a gift. It's, we have the right to believe. These signs follow those that believe, not these that are specially gifted. Man, we've made mistakes on this stuff in the church. We think it's always a gift and a special anointing and a healing grace on a person's life. And wonder if we're just believers. And these signs follow those that believe. Wonder if the more I know him and walk with him and be intimate with him, the more I understand and see his heart this way. And the more he flows because I know him. I wonder if faith flows out of knowing him. I wonder if knowing him makes things clear and confusion has gone and self-centered and self-consciousness is gone and all of a sudden Christ in me, the hope of glory is manifesting. I wonder if it's all about relationship, not just gifting. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> it is. It is all about relationship. Okay? Man. So we start praying. This dear lady comes up, cataract stuff. She can't hardly drive at night anymore. She can't hardly see when there's lights. She couldn't look to the back of the church and see anything. Everything was milk, like a milky haze. She's so precious. She said, I couldn't have turned her. I couldn't have got somebody else. I wanted to pray for her. I was like, let me at her. She's so sweet. She said, could you please pray for my eyes? I said, you better not pray for anything, honey. You name it. I'll tell half the kingdom. It's yours. The whole kingdom. Prayed for her. It was so sweet. Said, look, look at the lights. Tell me what you're seeing. Just check it out. And she goes, Oh dear. Oh dear. What's going on? It's crystal clear. Crystal clear, right? Now watch this. There was a guy that came up to me in the beginning of the service. We prayed for in the back. He wanted to see. He couldn't read the words on the screen. And he's young. The night before, he got born again. He had schizophrenia stuff going on. He was suicidal and he was fighting the gospel. When I got up there preaching, he was like, hmm, yeah, whatever. Hmm. He was blowing me off, right? Not for long. It was so fun to watch. I'm pouring out my heart and I see this guy, hmm, 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 you know, and he's looking down. I started sharing like, it's not just about we're such pitiful sinners and our lives are so wretched and Jesus had to die because we're such mess ups. That's what we've been taught. Yeah. All my life I thought the blood of Jesus was just because I was so sinful. I didn't realize that God wanted to get away the sin to get to who I am and that I had great value to God in the kingdom of God. I didn't realize that he really wanted to come and live in me and move through me. I thought I just needed the blood because I was such a mess. It was always going to be such a mess. So I was in my mid-30s. I didn't even understand the gospel. I thought I had to pray a prayer and accept Jesus so I could go to heaven and God would look past my sin, but I was always just a sinner. <laughs> I am so not just a sinner. <laughs> See, I understand now. God paid an amazing price for me because I'm worth a lot to Him. He loves me. He doesn't even see the sin. He's like, what sin? I love that guy. <laughs> Serious! I understand now. Oh my gosh, the struggle's over. There's joy that I don't have to think about or try for. No more biting your lip to be a Christian. <laughs> oh, it's Sunday? Oh. <laughs> I wanted to sleep. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? 
Of course he died and shed his blood because of the sin, but God knew that once he gets the sin off, there's something worth dying for. I was never taught that my whole life. I was taught, pray this prayer and go to heaven because you sure don't want to go to hell. And it's amazing God considers you because you'll always be a sinner and you'll never be perfect. And one day in heaven, he'll let you in because you prayed a prayer. Might be a fool not to pray the prayer. I wonder if they're right. No, everybody ever really told me that. He loved me and wanted to have fellowship with me and that I had great value to God. And that I was created in the beginning in his image and through the fall I became self-centered and selfish and took on the nature of God's enemy and I needed born again and put off the old and put on the new. Not in a works thing to get right with God because he made me right. Because it's who I am. Oh my gosh. So I'm sharing this stuff and this guy that's blowing me off He's on, he's on the edge of his seat, leaning forward, holding the back of the pew going, and he's crying. 20 minutes into it, he's totally undone. Yeah. I mean, this guy was being so sarcastic inside and expressive and like, whatever. Oh, yeah. So he put on his happy jacket tonight. <laughs> Till the word came and got in. So I asked some people to stand up that never understood and really never denied themselves. They just prayed a prayer to go to heaven, etc. And five ladies stood up crying. I said, listen, I see five ladies standing and that's great. And God bless you. And I'm so glad you're standing. We're going to pray in a minute and it'll just be sweet. I said, there's two young men and I don't know why you're standing. God, would you just stand up? And they both went... Both of them. And one was this fella. This young fella. So he comes up the next night and he's pumped, man. God got on him. I walked right over. This other guy stood up, bound in anger and stuff, and went over. And I said, God bless you for standing. I appreciate your courage. And he's God's on him. And this kid, God just landed on him. He curled up beside the guy and sat and cried. Just let him go. So the next night he came up and he said, I want, I want, man, I want God to touch my eyes. I want my eyes healed. I can't, I can't hardly see. I'm so young. And I said, let's pray right now, man. So we prayed and he started reading and seeing a little better, but it wasn't like right yet. But he could see better and he was pumped. I said, man, I'm going to check you out at the end of the service and see how that's coming along. We'll pray again if we need to. Okay. So he said, okay. So he's like 24 hours old in the Lord. He's like, he had no teaching under his belt. He hadn't been to discipleship class. He hadn't been to how to pray for the sick seminar. He's just got a living Jesus on the inside. And he's now alive. He's not real technical because nobody got him that way yet. Oops. <laughs> He's kind of like a child. And I think God can use that. I pray for this lady. She goes, oh dear. I said, you can see perfect. She said, sir, I can see crystal clear. I got up on the steps. I'm yelling. There's people just all around just crying, yielding. Todd, he's just having a field day. Josh, Josh, where are you? Get up here. He's like, he comes running up. I said, can you see yet? He said, it's the same as when you prayed back there. It's a tiny bit better, but it's still... I said, she's going to pray for you right now, okay? I went over to pray for somebody else. They're over there squealing in 10 seconds. He's reading banners and everything, right? So this other guy sees what's going on, and he said, can you pray for my eyes? My eyes are going out. It's bad, man. He had these thick glasses. I, said, I looked at Josh. I said, get him, man. Touch him. Pray. Just me. Yeah. He lays hands on his eyes. Said, be healed and see. And he's kind of saying simple stuff like he heard me say, right? He looks at me and he goes, so you love this dog. He goes, oh, I feel the power of God coming out of my head. I said, that's a good thing, you know. Jesus Christ. And the guy goes, whoa. Oh my gosh. See why I act the way I am? 
It's so fun. You think it can't get better? But this guy, Todd, comes around and there's so much stuff going on. He comes up and he's like, whoa, dude, and trying to tell stories. And I'm like, whoa, dude. And we're just there. And it's just too much going on. It's like God's there. Right. So I said, well, pray for them. I said, I need to pray for this lady. And they're going to be praying for this guy. And he's like, yeah, the guy he prayed for is pigeon toed from birth. Really bad. He gets him up and he says, I need you to start walking. Just like this. He goes, totally normal. In three steps, Jesus turned his ankles out, locked them there just like they're supposed to be. His wife turned and saw him coming. Very good wife. He just freaks out, runs and grabs him, and they're just hugging each other. And then he just goes like this. And he's just crying. There's a guy, the music's loud. There's a guy saying, can you pray for my ears? I got tonight is so bad I can hear it over the music. I look at the guy with the feet, with the healed feet. I said, touch his ears, man. Just command the ringing to stop. I no sooner turn my back, I'm trying to get to this lady. He's instantly healed of tonight's. He went out in the quiet foyer towards the men's room, towards the nursery, totally quiet. He comes back and he's freaking out. So we keep releasing all these people to pray for people. And God's just going, so fun. So I really, he blessed me. He let me have fun. This lady couldn't work for five months because of her feet. They were contorting and they were, they weren't good. They had bulges on them and it was a disease. She named it. I didn't, I don't give much attention to that stuff. So I want to pray for her. Doesn't matter what it is. I don't need the history. Honestly, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not being disrespectful. I don't even, it doesn't even matter. Sometimes that stuff matters and it doesn't. We know too much. Sometimes stuff has notoriety in our heads. You have what? Oh. And you got a memory of somebody that didn't get healed or somebody that, you know what I mean? And all of a sudden this thing's got power. I'll tell you what has power. I feel it. I'm telling you, I just feel God. You said you were his favorite. I think you're right. We were worshiping. He looked over and said, I'm God's favorite. I said, buddy, you're number two. But I think you were right. I think you're a savior. I hold her feet. She hasn't worked for five months. She can hardly walk with shoes on. She takes her shoes off. I take her feet and I think in my heart, oh, dear lady. Her feet were, they were getting messed up. They were, they were messed up. I don't know. Did you ever see arthritis twist hands? Her, her feet had humps and twists and it was bad. And I held her feet. Jesus fixed her feet under in my hands. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I was praying, and I'm like, you are so awesome. I can just feel her feet get right in my hands. Not like in the morning. You know how we say, well, take heart, honey. They were healed as they went. Boy, we got the miles out of that scripture, didn't we? It's the only one in the gospel where it didn't just happen. And man, we sucked that thing out. The life out of that baby almost. We have. Man, I want it. I want her feet changing in my hands because it's Jesus' experience. And he said, follow me. And as the Father sent me, I send you. Yes. If you believe the things I do, you'll do. And the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in me to do the same things for his name's sake. Not to build a ministry, not to draw attention to men, because he loves people. So I'm holding her feet, and I feel them change in my hands. And I said, honey, check your feet. She stands up, and she's like, oh, I love watching the reactions of people. <sighs> And she's freaked out, jumping all over, bare feet, jumping all over the place. Hasn't worked for five. One prayer of faith that works through love. And then feet said, yes, Lord. 
I'll restore back to original value. That infirmity said, out of here. I'll let her go. Because you are king. Man, there's so many. You said about selling things. I've been so many places. I don't even know where I've been lately. I've been around. There's so many things I'm not even telling anymore. There's so many things. It's crazy. Oh, God, you're good. Come more and more. I'm saying it seriously. And, and here's what I'm excited about it's the people at large praying. And everywhere I go, I see there's pockets of people, the body of Christ, that want more, that are hungry, that are saying, come, Lord, that are open for the gospel. They're not sitting there, yeah, but brother, you got to understand. They're just hearing the word and going, yes, Lord. And he's, oh, it's fun. People are getting right. We had uh, four demonic manifestations where the love and presence of God was so profuse, they only had a little moment to manifest. And they were going, like, like you know, weird stuff where, oh, that's, that's the devil. But, but, but they don't have a right to distract. They, they're defeated. The first sign of a believer is cast them things out. Not because we're somebody, because Jesus is, and he's changed that. We were crushed. We were under their feet, and Jesus, so good. This one guy, his eyes rolled up in his head. He's believing so many lies. Prayed for him. He gets free. He starts crying. He starts praising Jesus. He starts saying, thank you for loving me, God. And he's out praying for the sick. Five minutes later. I like that. I don't think Jesus is technical. I don't think that he had issues with that. I don't think he was saying, look, son, take a three-month sabbatical, get through some discipleship classes, and one day you'll be ready. He is so ready. He's free. He's realizing he was bound, and now he's free. He was blind, and now he can see. Freely received, freely. Yeah. Did you ever notice in the gospel, Mark 16, he comes through the wall, I guess. Jesus, right? They're crying in fear of the Jews. He said he'd raise five, six times through the gospels. I'll die, but I'll raise. I'll die, but I'll raise. I'll die, but on the third day, I'll raise. And everywhere you read it, it says, and they were filled with grief. They totally missed that. All they heard was, you're going to die? Death ruled, death reigned in their souls. Remember, he came and defeated him who had the power over death. So death shouldn't rule in our souls. Death, death, death shouldn't be eating our lunch in the fear of death. You shouldn't hear somebody has terminal cancer and pray because you don't want them to die. It's always about life. It's not about, oh my God, death. Jesus didn't even understand that. He's the author and giver of life. He goes to the little girl and says she's sleeping and they mock him because they're ruled by death. They're blowing their, their horns to have a funeral and tell them the city there's a funeral. Ooh, there's going to be a funeral. Come, pay your respect. Somebody has died. And he's like, get out of here. There ain't going to be no funeral. <laughs> we say he's getting the unbelief out of the room. <laughs> Jesus was surrounded by unbelief constantly. Doesn't stop the power of God. We've taught that in the church and we've hurt ourselves bad. Jesus said, leave. There's no need to let the town know there's a death because she's coming up. There's not going to be a funeral. Stop piping the pipes. Come on. He goes in, little girl, arise. We teach it as if he went in, little girl, arise. You, 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 and you out of the room. Little girl, arise. Ha ha. It's so twisted. The Nazareth thing, I teach it a lot. I'm not going to stay there long. He could do no mighty thing or miracle in their, his own hometown because of their... That's the big one that everybody camps out on and makes a doctrine out of, and it's very simple. They stereotype him. He's marrying Joseph's son. They grew up with him, and they're thinking he's a crackpot because who are you to say you've come down from him? He's your father. We know who you are. And they didn't go rally and get the sick and bring him to Jesus. Every city he went into, they thronged him with the sick. But in his hometown, they're like, here comes Cuckoo. And they went the other way. Read in your Bible the rejection of Jesus in Nazareth. The unbelief is a stereotyping. It's an indignance. It's a familiar. It's a contempt thing. It's a tap. Who do you think you are? We watched you grow up. And they had no capacity of faith. What 
do you think would happen in Nazareth if they went and got a paralytic and carried him there? I said, okay, you're from above? Heal the man. You think Jesus says, well, I would really love to, but based on the love of unbelief in your hearts, I'm really limited in my capacity to move on this gentleman's behalf. Ah! Ah! Because there was a man in the temple with a hand like this, and he was just there. There's no evidence that he knew he was the Christ. In fact, they were always bickering and debating who he was, who he wasn't, ah, ah, ah. and he was still healing everybody. John 12 gives it away. John 12, I think 37 says, even though he did all these mighty things among them, they still did not believe in him. That means all the mighty things he did was in the realm of unbelief because if they didn't believe after, they sure didn't believe before. Oops. So all the Pharisees are there and they see this guy. And they go, oh. Every time he gets around this person, he heals him. It's the Sabbath. We got a whole bunch of witnesses. We can pin him down and we can find wrong with him in front of everybody. We can track this guy down. Here's this guy. He's a scapegoat. He's a guinea pig. They're exploiting his situation. There's no indication in the Bible that he's there for healing. It's the Sabbath. He's just there because it's right to be in church. They walk over and say, uh, teacher, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? I mean, that's like throwing bait to him, right? They got him. He can't say, he heals everybody. They know it. Does it have anything to do with faith? Is there any evidence of faith in the man with the withered hand? It's animosity. It's accusation. It's trickery. It's trappery. It's everything but faith. And Jesus says, oh, he's amazing. Who of you having a sheep falls into a pit when lifted out on the Sabbath? How much more valuable is a man than a sheep? Do you hear what he was saying? I'm healing him and it has nothing to do with you. Whether you believe or don't believe, I'm healing him because he's precious to God. It doesn't even have to do with the man. He doesn't even know who he is to God. But I know, so he's getting healed. Stretch forth your hands. Oh my gosh, how do we miss that in the Bible? Because he acknowledged faith a few times, we think everybody has to have it. No, he's acknowledging faith because it's a good thing to believe. Blessed are those who believe and have not. Why? Because they don't put themselves through the hell of unbelief. It's simple. Unbelief has some attachments to it <laughs> called worry, fear, sleeplessness, anxiety. Oh my God, oh my God. <laughs> Faith has a lot of benefits to it. <sighs> Serious. Faith is where it's at. You want to be in faith. So Jesus always honored faith and acknowledged that faith made men whole. But that was only probably a third of the examples we have in the Bible. The rest was his faith because he wanted to. Because he loves. He tells us whatever city we're in, heal the sick there. There's no parentheses, of course, unless they don't have faith. Of course, unless if it's not the divine sovereign will or timing of God. No, what he's saying is we ought to know who we've become through Christ. Now go heal the sick and give them the kingdom that's come to you. For freely you've received, freely give. We've made so much doctrine and theology up with healing, we've got ourselves so confused because of what hasn't happened. And we define the gospel through our experiences instead of the word of God and the life of Jesus Christ. And that's got to stop in the body of Christ. Jesus never said to anyone, Sorry, I can't. It's not your time. And it's not the will of God. When he said it to the Syrophoenician woman, she made a draw in his heart. And he said, oh, girl, your daughter's fine. Just go home. And the only reason he said it to her is because he came to the house of Israel to the Jews first. She was a Syrophoenician lady. And when he said it's not good to give the children's bread, which is healing, to their dogs, she said, yes, but master. Or yes, but Lord, even the little dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And you say, oh, go home, get out of here, your girl's fine. <laughs> it wasn't some sovereign administrative decision from God. I don't want to heal her daughter. <laughs> Tell her now. <laughs> He's so twisted. He's not at a desk of administration calling the shots today. 
He's given us the kingdom. The earth he did give to the children of men. He put the power of life and death in our tongues. There's a law of sowing and reaping. There's the power of prayer in his name. There's the power of the unity of faith and agreement. It has very little to do with the administrative sovereign choice of God today. Because when you preach that stuff, it becomes passive in your heart. Your place gets annulled. To be a warrior in the stuff we're singing and what creation's groaning for? People that know their God do great exploits. Whatever city you're in, heal the sick there and tell them you're healed because the kingdom's come. How many of us are even thinking, living that way? Passing by the sick every day and have no revelation. Not being mean, but we go to church because that's what we've been taught. Your Christians go to church. No, you're Christians. You are the church. You're the expression of his will, his goodness, his kindness, his love, his mercy. Jesus said, when you see me, you see the Father. And he said, the way the Father sent me, I'm sending you. So when you see us, you ought to see him. We didn't pray a prayer to go to heaven, guys. We're restored back to original value, and God is love, and he created us in his image, and that's who we are. What do you say? We put off the old man and put on the new. And love never fails, and faith works through it. We're not trying to have faith. We say of how much more valuable is a man than a sheep. Amen. Sir, stretch forth your hand. That's powerful. Listen, there's a guy laying by a pool. 38 years. Whoa. <laughs> Jesus walks up to him and says, Hey, bud, you want to be healed? He goes, You think he said, What are you, some kind of hot crack? <laughs> think about it. I looked at that and I'm thinking, Jesus, what kind of question was that? He's laying by the pool for 38 years, <laughs> waiting for the water to stir. And every time it stirs, he goes, <laughs> And he can't get there, and somebody else jumps in. And the first one in, whoever was healed of all oh, their big words, whoever, whatever. See that whatever with an attitude ain't good, but when God says whatever, it's good. Okay? Look, they're really hurting. They got whatever. Yeah, but God, it's whatever. Yeah, but you're already whatever. Just take the whatever and run with it, okay? Whatever. <laughs> Whoever, whatever. Oh my gosh, that sounds like Mark 11. Whoever says believing shall have whatever. Believing, fully convinced. Not driven by need, not turning the gospel into a principle by which to receive something. Not trying out God, 30 day money back guarantee. Fully convinced. Knowing his will. Praying, believing, saying to the mountain, move. Not hope, wish, God, we need this. <laughs> Come on, we're trapped there almost all the time. It's the reason we cause so many prayer chains. We think the more people we get praying, the more power we can have released or something. I'm not against prayer chains, but they usually operate with fear. It's all right to talk about this. We've got to talk about this. We usually grab the phone and call because of fear. We usually move by the problem, not the promise. Usually the crisis rules us, not the Christ that lives in us. 99.9% .9 of the time Christians pray it's because of what's going wrong instead of what he's made right. And then we cry out to God for help and he's already brought help and done help and given help and he's waiting for us to move. We're waiting for him and he's saying your move. He said faith will say to the mountain not cry out to God. That means faith recognizes who we've become because of the Christ. We speak to the mountain and it moves because the kingdom rules and reigns on the earth. It's powerful. We haven't gotten that. Because we prayed for Fred and he's died, we said, yeah, but see, and we've made a doctrine out of that, and we've comforted our hearts at the cost of his word. He's magnified his word above his name, Psalms 138.2. We sure ought to magnify his word above our circumstances. If Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God, if when you see him, you've already seen the Father, Hebrews 1, he's the expressed image of God and the outbreak of his glory and brightness, then everything you see about the life of Jesus is who the Father is. And if Jesus didn't say it, then God didn't say it, and we shouldn't be saying it either. You never saw Jesus walk up to a man and say, you know, I'd love to heal you, it's just not the will of God. You know, Barb, I hear your heart cry, and I'd love to do it. It's just not quite the timing of the Father. You know, I'd love to heal you, brother, but God is sovereignly working this into your life to build character, and there's a grace on it, so grin and bear it, and just trust God.
You never heard God say any of that to anyone through Jesus in the whole Gospels, his life and ministry. And that Jesus told me to follow him. But we say those things all the time because there's a way that seems right to a man, but its way leads to destruction. And if we embrace that as truth, we'll never step into truth. And truth is what makes us free. And we'll continue to get the same results and the same results to say, see, told you, see, just wasn't his time. See, it just wasn't his will. Well, I'll tell you, if that's the case, it ain't the will of God to heal a whole lot of folks because we've lost a whole lot of battles. My Bible says heal the sick. My Bible says, is any among you sick? God asks the question. If he provokes the question, he must have something to say about it. Who believes the word of God is God speaking? In James 5, he says, who among you is sick? Is there anybody? Hello? Is anybody sick? Call the elders of the church. That doesn't mean office of elder. It means maturing, spiritual, believing ones. It doesn't mean office. Because there's people in office of elder that don't even believe it's the will of God to heal. The word elder means spiritual, maturing, believing ones. Call the elders of the church. Have them anoint him with oil, praying over him the prayer of faith, fully convinced, believing, the realization of what you're hoping for, the evidence of what you haven't yet seen, because you've been with Papa and you know his heart, you know his will through the word, through Jesus Christ. You're not anointing with oil as an ordinance and saying, if it be your will. It's the prayer of faith that saves the sick. God didn't even, he's so humble, he's so making us one with him in this. He tells us to heal the sick. We can't! And he says, heal the sick. Man, I've been wanting to do something for a week now. I was going to try it tonight, and I didn't get there yet, but I think I'm going there now. Turn to Job chapter 1. I've been wanting to preach Job for a while. It's the most misunderstood book, in my opinion, in the body of Christ in the whole Bible. I hear people say, well, brother, remember Job. You know Job. And I'm thinking, what about Job? And I don't even know that they know what they're talking about when they say that. Some people use the the sufferings of Job as their reason for suffering with no expectation of deliverance or restoration. Are you all in Job? It's in your Bible. It's the Old Testament. It's way back towards the front. You can find it. I want to read something quick and then I'll skip back here to Job. It's right before Psalms, by the way. It's right after Esther, right? James chapter 5 is amazing. No, you can stay in Job. I'm not trying to confuse you. This is what led me to Job. I've preached out of Job before, but it got burning in my heart when I was in the hotel in Ohio. I had Todd, that boy. He's so funny. He's laying over there in his bed, and I went, oh my gosh, God. And I shut my Bible, and I'm just laying there. He says, come on, brother. Don't hold out on a brother. He says, don't be holding out on a brother. I said, I don't even want to talk. No, it's just, oh my gosh, Father. No. I'm just laying there praying and talking, and he's just laying there quiet for about two minutes, and he says, you really are holding out on the brother. He said, come on, man, give it up, give it up, dish it out. Come on, I'm all ears, I'm waiting. And I said, no, man, I don't even want to, I'm not getting into it right now. I said, there's something I just got to meditate and muse on. Oh, that's just wrong, that's just wrong. He said, you, you hold out on the brother, you know. So yeah, so he gets quiet, and I'm just there, and, and, then, and then I just started talking, and he just kind of smiled. He's like, I thought you were going to hold out on me. I really thought you were. That boy was so fired up. Oh my gosh, we were talking. We went through the book of James 4, chapter 4, just started going through it, preaching it. Rolled into 5, just preaching it. And he's like, oh, oh, oh. he's a soft part. And then we got to the Job part. Well, then we were through the roof, man. Because I'll tell you, the devil is a snake and a liar. And I'm telling you what, he's not just the accuser of the brother to God. He's the accuser of God to the brother. We have called a lot of we have called God a lot of things that the devil's been responsible for. We've called him a thief. We said he took your kids. He wanted an angel up there, so he just took your child. Because we don't know what to say. Because we don't know how to relate to that kind of loss and pain in folks. So the easiest way is to put it on God and try to make it sound spiritual so they kind of can hold on, but who's really okay? We say we just talk about this kind of stuff. Because great told me that we call God what the enemy's doing and what he is. He came in John 10.10 and said, the thief comes 
to steal, kill, destroy. But I have come to give you life and life even more. Don't you cross the two. Please don't you cross the two. It's a clear job description. Thief, loss, and destruction. Jesus, life, and life more. People with, and I'm not being rude, very shallow understanding say to me all the time, well, brother, you have to die of something. Where does it ever say you have to die of sickness? You show me one scripture that says cancer is called to eat your flesh away. You show me one scripture that says you have to die of sickness and disease. You run your course. You fulfill the will of God. You tell me where it says after 65, the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus doesn't cover you anymore. And the aging factor supersedes the resurrection power of the Lord Jesus. See, we've accepted the way that seems right to men, and we've accepted our experience as normal. And then we embrace it when it comes, even though we don't enjoy it and want it, we embrace it as the way it is. I'm telling you, if it's good enough for you when you're 25, it's good enough when you're 65. I love this story of the lady out in California, 103, dying of cancer. You know what we, we would say as Christians? Man, she's 103. That's longer than most folks. She's got to die of something, you know. Praise God, just let it be quick. Right? The church said, man, this ain't God. This she ain't dying of cancer. Man, we got to get on this thing. They are rebuking that cancer and praying. That girl got totally healed, 103 years old. Completely totally healed of cancer. Lived 18 or 16 more months and died in her sleep one night. I love that. 103. Church had the gusto to go after and say, this ain't God. Nine out of ten congregations wouldn't even jump in that fight because, hey, they can't believe they're going to live half that long. That mama's been around with us. Hey, bless her. She had a long life. Praise God. Let's go be with him. They fought the good fight. They got in there and said, get off of her. You're not God or the will of God. And the gospel came and saved her from that sickness. And she lived 16 or 18 more months, went to sleep one night, never woke up. That's God. I love that. Man, people say, well, my, my, this and that. And they say, well, how old are they? Well, they're this, oh, well, yeah, man, you got to go with something, brother. This just might be his time. Man, I hear that everywhere I go. My Bible says, because I set my love upon him, he'll honor me, deliver me, he'll show me his salvation. With long life, he'll satisfy me. Sounds like my days can get prolonged just by having the right relationship and understanding. We're destroyed for the lack of, not the sovereign choice of God. Get the knowledge, stop destruction. It's simple. Come on. It's simple. It's just too easy to rationalize this stuff and make it seem right at the cost of this book. Because this is where the power is. Because you've lost Billy and Bob and Fred, and, 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 and then now you're praying for Jimmy, and you got all that in your track record, and you've created a bunch of things that you say and cliches to crutch up your heart and pain and soul, and now you got to pray for Jimmy. And Jimmy ought to find another church so he can get prayed for. <laughs> Serious. Because <laughs> Jimmy's in trouble. <laughs> if something don't change, Jimmy's in trouble. Because you're going to pray all this experience is going to pass through some filter system and some belief system that's evolved through your Christian life. And you're going to keep getting the same results and it's going to affirm what you say. And you're going to say, See, he'll heal if he wants to. Obviously, he didn't want to. Next thing you know, you got a question, does he ever want to heal? Especially in terminal stuff. Because we lost way too many folks. What's it mean when it says, ask, believing, and receive all things, whatever you ask in prayer, believing? What's it mean when two touch anything on earth, believing, it shall be done? What's it mean? Lay your hands on the sick and they shall recover. Is there any among you sick? Anoint him with oil. Pray the prayer of faith and the prayer of faith will save the sick. Not the prayer of God. I hope this Jimmy doesn't die like the rest. And God, you got to have mercy and reach out and touch him. God. See, we think that's the humble prayer, but it's not the authority prayer. It's not the prayer of power and releasing the kingdom. We think it's arrogant and presumptuous, but the word of God tells us to pray that way. It's not our idea. A lot of leadership doesn't want to touch this thing with a 10-foot pole because there's so many circumstances like this and hot potato stuff. My Bible says, get my hands on it and pray. So if I lose somebody, what do I do? I get in the bedroom and say, God, you've got to build this kingdom in me and give me revelation and draw my heart closer to who you are because if I'm going to follow you, I've got to see what you see so I can do what you do because I represent the kingdom. So God, thank you for increasing who you are in me. 
and you get alone and you don't take the lost personal turn tail and run and crutch up your message to... No, you get before God and say, there's a way for me to see, touch, or you wouldn't have told me that in the Bible. Nobody's ever taught me that in my whole life. Jesus taught me that in my bedroom. Not to take lost personal depression and seek God. And then I get around here, people like Bill Johnson and people are preaching this stuff, and I'm excited because God's speaking to his people to get up and be the army of God and stop being afraid. I guess I got grace to do this. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I'm not just doing this because I want to. Okay. I'm going to do it. You in Job? Yep, James. No, I'm in James. You're supposed to be in Job. <laughs> Verse 7 of James 5, and I'm not trying to confuse you. Just stay in Job. It says, be patient, brethren. And then in verse 8, it says, you, it talks about the farmer waiting. It says, you be patient and establish your heart for the coming of the Lord is at hand. That's huge. You preach all day on that. Did you hear this? You be patient, establish your heart, James 5, 8, because the coming of the Lord is at hand. What it's saying is don't embrace the yes and no gospel. Don't get fickle. Don't let circumstances be your teacher. Let the word of God be your teacher. Establish your heart and go after the yes. Go after God. You might have turned up with a couple no's, but the Bible says yes. Go after it and grow up into him in all things. Come on, a lot of it's self-preservation. We, we want to feel, we try to make ourselves feel good and we try to cover ourselves and come out of it spiritual. I don't want to impose or imply to come out of it spiritual at the cost of truth where the real power is. Because the next time I'm in that situation, I need increase. Come on, I'm talking plain. You be patient, establish your heart because Jesus is coming back. And you better be settled in what you believe. Because if you're settled in what you believe, you'll be producing fruit. And in this, the Father's well pleased that you bear much fruit. It doesn't say in this, the Father's well pleased. I'm not being mean that you go to church. I'm not against going to church. But we've made it about going to church. No, we're to take on the likeness, image, and nature of God and manifest Him wherever we are. He's teaching me this stuff. I'm excited. Because if you do that, you'll leave a legacy. Your heart's established. You'll leave a legacy. And you'll be fruitful. When he comes, I want fruit. If he has fruit on you, he said, he'll prune you so you bear even more. He says, Bob, you're bearing fruit. Cool. And then, more fruit. More fruit. So good. It's just what we do because we're Christians. You get down here, it says, indeed, we count them blessed to endure. You have heard the perseverance of Job and seen the end, the end intended by God. You have to realize that God didn't, didn't do this to Job. We're going to go look right at the story. But watch, because here's the deal. When you look at the story of Job, if you have a misconception of it, I've heard it preached. I've heard crazy stuff like God subcontracted the devil. The devil talked God into... There's all kinds of stuff I've heard that God did this to him. It says here that you see the perseverance of Job, and you've got to understand when we look at the book, you're going to see that Job didn't have a clue. He didn't have a revelation of the devil, and he had a terrible understanding of who God was, except he had an integrity towards God and knew he was the potter and Job was the clay, and he would never curse him or say anything against him because he just knew he was God. Okay? So that's what Job had going for him. But he had very little understanding outside of that. And so did all his friends. Watch this. It says, you see the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Somebody that doesn't understand would say, well, if God was compassionate and merciful, he wouldn't have let him lose his kids and all his servants and all his livestock in the first place. Oh, some compassionate, merciful God. Come on, get real with me. Come on, if God was compassionate and merciful, why is he going through hell in the first place? It's okay if I say that word in church. Because I'm ready to say it again. Because hell is ruling on the earth. Because man had fallen. And Satan's the power and prince and power of the air. He's the ruler of darkness. He's the God of this world. He says in Luke 4 that all these kingdoms and their glory have been given to me. He didn't need God's permission, nor could he entice God. He was trying to get God to be who he was. He told God to stretch forth his hand and do that to Job. And God said, well, he's in your power. All that he has is in your power. We think he's delegating authority to Satan. We think Satan's talking God into some deal to test his servant. No, all that he has is in your power. Why? 
Because Job's a man under sin. Satan's the ruler of this world. When man fell, he set up his kingdom all over the earth. Powers, principalities, darkness, rulers in heavenly places. And they fight vehemently against the kingdom of God. There's nations still where those kingdoms are set and established and they've never been confronted by the church. Follow me? And let's make sure one of those is in America, huh? God, it's a scary thought. I don't know what's worse, witchcraft or religion. God. You and Job, you ought to be by now. I don't understand. I'm not going to claim to understand what this means when the sons of God came and Satan was there. I don't believe Satan has any right to walk into the presence of God because he's dark and God's light. And if he would walk into the throne of God, he would get smoked and disintegrated. I don't believe he can or will. I think it was some kind of communication, accountability, some kind of... I don't think he just strolled into heaven and started speaking up. God is light. There's no darkness in him at all. Light can't comprehend the darkness. Light crushes darkness. Okay? So I, I'm not, I'm not going to try to explain that. I, that's, that's not even necessary to explain. Watch this. The Lord said to Satan, I think this is amazing. He said, from where did you come from? And Satan said, from going to and fro. Where? On the earth, from walking back and forth on it. Why? Because he was cast out of heaven. He's no longer, he's no longer got the seat of worship. He's no longer an archangel. He's no longer in the presence of God. He's cast to the earth. Satan, he saw him fall like lightning. So he's walking on the earth. Now watch. The Lord said, Have you considered my servant Job that there's none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? It's amazing when you hear people, we know that every man sinned and he's, you know, uh, fallen short of the glory of God. There's no blood of Jesus and God's calling him blameless. He obviously had a faith toward God. He obviously had a sense of righteousness, right? But we know that everyone has sinned and everyone's fallen short. Some people say this is the patriarchal age before the law was actually there. But regardless, Satan is the God of this world. When did that happen? When man ate the tree, when Adam ate the tree, the kingdom of darkness was set up and established. Who knows that's true, scripturally? And he said, all these kingdoms and all their glory has been handed over to me. He's the prince and power of the air, okay? He's the god of this world. He's the ruler of darkness. I love this. There's a lot to this. I can't get into detail with it. But just, I just want to cover some basic stuff here. But he says, have you considered my servant Job? When you see the Old Testament, you have to realize it's pointing to New Testament, New Covenant, reality, revelation. It points to Jesus. It points to the church of Jesus Christ. Don't interpret it apart from the New Testament and what we already understand through the New. There's a minister, I think he was Perry Stone, and I liked what he said. I heard him say, uh, the Old Testament's the New Testament concealed. The New Testament's the Old Testament revealed. I like that. That's really good. So if you're, if you're, if you're revelation of the Old Testament or your definition of truth, you can't find Jesus in it or it doesn't point you to New Testament truth, you probably need to reevaluate what you're thinking. Because it's all pointing to Christ the whole way through. Okay, watch this. God says, have you considered? It's talking about sanctification, but he's saying like there's a man different. His heart's different than other men. Every heart of the man of man is the same, but Job's different. He's pointing that out. God is. It reminds me of Ephesians 3, that the gospel came with the intent that God would reveal his manifold wisdom to the powers and principalities of darkness through the church. There's a people set apart, sanctified, that will love me and manifest me and crush you. And I'll reveal my glory and my wisdom through the blood of my son and the people I redeem through it. Yes, yes. I'm going to show you I'm God through them. Yes. You think you've won, you think you've got them fallen and they can't get up, I'm getting them up. It's true. It's powerful. Read Ephesians 3. It's right there. God said, it's interesting. God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's no man like him. He fears God and shuns evil. I believe that's symbolic. I believe, I believe that's prophetic. I believe there's a people called the sanctified people of God, the church of Jesus Christ, who have come out from among them and be ye separate. And the Spirit of God is upon him. Satan says, look, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, around everything on every side? Have you blessed, not blessed the works of his hands, his possessions, and increased the land, him in the land? 
Guess what he's saying? God's only being respected by Job because he's blessed Job. That's what he's saying. He's saying, Job only loves you because you've loved him. Job's only blessing you because you've blessed him. Job isn't any different than any other man. That's what he's telling God. Now, we know he's a liar from the beginning. We know God is truth. And if God says Job's different and there's nobody like Job, who knows that there's nobody like Job right now on the earth, right? At this time. And Satan says, well, he's only like that because you bless him on every side. He's selfish like any other man. You take the blessing away from him, he'll curse you just like any other man curses you. If things go well for him, everything's right between him and God. If things ain't going well for him, then he ain't all right with God. Because you know, God, I caused them to eat the tree. They're self-centered. They're just like me. Every man's under sin. Every man's under my power. And they don't love you. They love themselves more than you. They only love you because of what you do for them. That's what he's saying. You want to read it? It's powerful. (laughs) He says, but stretch forth your hand, talking to God, and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. Here's what he's saying. Who knows that, that, who knows that Satan came and tempted Jesus in the wilderness? Who knows that it's not beyond him? He's a tempter. Does it matter if it's God? Guess what he's saying to God? He's, oh my gosh, you gotta hate the devil. He's going, don't give him place, please. Cause here's what he's doing. Yeah, well, yeah, of course you say that because you blessed him. You, you, he doesn't really love you. You can find out if you just take something away. Just take the stuff you give him away. You'll see who he really is. He's God. He knows who he is. Here's what Satan's doing. He's saying, you do what I do. You take my job description and do what I do. You stretch forth your hand and touch him. And he'll curse you. And God says, all that he has is in your power. That's where people say, well, God delegated authority, subcontracted Satan to go and touch Job. Gave him permission. Did he need permission? Did he need permission? This is amazing. Look, stretch forth your hand, touch all that he has. He will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said, behold, all that he has is in your power, right? Or your hand. In other words, I don't need to stretch forth my hand. I never would. And he's already in your power. So if you believe that about him, you'll see. Here's the whole deal. The adversity that came to Job's life was for one reason. Not because he sinned. Not because he was in self-righteousness and all the things his friends said. Not because he was in folly. Not because he was in an unrepentant heart. All the things his friends accused him of. We do it in the church all the time. Well, you know they're going through all this stuff. I mean, there got to be some closets in their life. I mean, if there's something in it, you know, they got to be some issues, man. I'm telling you, they got to be some unresolved because they'd be hedged in better than that. If they, oh, hell's breaking loose over there. I mean, they got to be some stuff they ain't fessing up to. They open the door somewhere saying got some straight avenue right at him, man. Who's ever heard that? People talking to each other like that. All of a sudden, the pastor's going through something. Oh, oh, mm, mm, yeah. Mm, yeah. Fellow brothers and sisters, here we are accusing one another. We're supposed to be driving the devil off of each other and, and, and encouraging one another and locking arms and fighting together, and we're accusing and assuming and projecting and presumption. Well, you know, if they were really in faith, that wouldn't happen after. I mean, they need to know God more. Why don't we just order them a book for about faith for Christmas? <laughs> Come on, we've done all that. Uh. You know, we pray for sick folks all the time. We think, boy, if you just get more faith, brother, you'd be healed. God wants to heal you. You just got to believe. Take heart and believe. Go home believing. Don't you ever do that to a sick person. Don't you ever do, especially here. Don't you do it anywhere. That sick person can look at you and say, wait a minute, you're the body of Christ representing Christ to me. I thought you knew him. You're supposed to give me the kingdom. What do you believe? Couldn't they? Well, the Bible says to lay your hands on the sick believing. I'm the sick person. I'm not even the believer here. I'm in trouble. I need your help. I thought you believed. Hello? Make it all about them. Hey, look, I was believing. I touched him. I was in... I could just see fear all over him. I was believing. No, if you were believing, the mountain would move. Whoa. 
That's scriptural. Oh, mm. oh. It's, it's a hard one. Just slide. It's okay. Don't go down. Oh, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> These signs follow those that. So please don't pray for somebody and say, well, they should have just had faith. They could have been healed. I could feel God all over me. I felt God's power all over me, but they just wouldn't receive it because they didn't believe. I've heard that so many times. I'm thinking, man, you're deceived. Jesus is in a covenant of the law of sin and death, an Old Testament covenant when he comes, a root out of dry ground, no prophetic voice for hundreds of years, and everybody in the city they bring to him, he heals, and they ain't even sure who he is. There were so many issues in them people. They needed so much help. And yet everyone was healed because of his revelation and his love. It was straight from the Father. There was so much unforgiveness in those crowds, bitterness, unrighteousness. Who would agree that they were probably like not the best folks spiritually? I'll tell you the short giveaway. The Son of God was standing in front of them and they had no clue. <laughs> Their discernment level was a little dull. <laughs> the epitome of light was standing there and they couldn't see through the darkness. They put him on a cross, guys. The people too, not just the Pharisees, they cried out for Barabbas also. But yet everybody in the city was healed. Because the revelation in Jesus was so bright, nothing could stop it because he's Lord. Unforgiveness couldn't stop it. Bitterness couldn't stop it. Unbelief couldn't stop it. I wonder if we would just get a hold of that one. Because, man, the love of God can touch so profuse and rock their world, and all of a sudden they're aware of the unforgiveness, aware of the bitterness, aware of the unbelief. Now they're crying out in repentance, healed, and the goodness of God changes their mind. The mercy of God triumphs over judgment. How easy it is to sit back and assess people and come up with ten reasons why they're not healed and do the rhetorical Christian thing and pray anyway and say, well, no wonder. Let's stop that. Let's see past their life and see their value through Jesus Christ and realize if Jesus died for them and he's not a fool, he knows he died for something worth it. You give them love and you pray in Jesus' name. I don't ask questions. You don't see anybody in the cities Jesus taking a resume first in a background check. There's crowds thronging him, grabbing his cloak, just being healed by the dozens. So profuse that when somebody's healed and he said, who touched me? They're like, are you nuts? Everybody. No background check. No counseling line. No get your heart right first. The love of God is amazing, has the ability to line things up. The profuse presence of God has the ability to set things straight. I've watched people get healed and then they bawl and share how unworthy they are to be healed. And in that repentance, God tweaks their heart. And all of a sudden, they're right. So fun. I've had them cry and confess sins. I prayed for a lady once in the marketplace. She got healed, and she started weeping. And she told me she's a secret alcoholic and drinks herself to sleep every night. And then he came and touched my body. Oh, he loves you. While you were yet a sinner, he sent the son. <laughs> We got, we got this weird picture of God like he comes and goes, Ew. <laughs> Love covers a multitude of sin. Love doesn't take an account of a suffered wrong. Love doesn't seek its own. Love never fails. <laughs> wonder if we start seeing like that. wonder if we see past people's weakness. wonder if we see past the fear and the words and the disposition and some of the past practice. I the... wonder if we see past that and give them Jesus. Man. I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not doing too bad here. I'm trying. I'm trying. Not to do, I'm not trying to do bad. <laughs> he asked God, stretch with your hand. He said, all that he has is in your power. Only don't lay a hand on this person. So there, there's God protecting him. Who knows that if there wasn't a sovereignty of God, if there wasn't a level of protection on the earth, Satan would just wipe out humanity. <laughs> you sin, you die, right? 
Who knows that the waywardness of my life, growing up in church, misunderstanding, but knowing to do right and not, who knows that if God didn't mercifully watch over me and protect me at times and stop Satan from certain levels of authority and aggression against my life, I'd be toast by now. True? I'm not here to try to explain why some people aren't here and why some are. I'm saying he said, don't touch his person. Okay? So who... Who is active right now? Is it God or Satan? Who's, ag- who's aggressive against Job? Okay. There was a day uh, when they were all eating and drinking, etc. Messengers came, the ox were plowing. Uh, look at verse 15. The Sabines, they raided, they took, they killed, right? Verse 16. While he was still speaking, another came. Look what he said. The fire of God fell from heaven. Did the fire of God fall from heaven? And consume his servants and all that stuff and his and his and his animals, or was it the enemy? But did you hear his the serv- Did you hear the language? The fire of God fell and consumed everything. Okay, it's amazing. We talk like this today. While he was still speaking, the Chaldeans formed three bands, raided, killed, sword, etc. While he's still speaking, your sons and daughters are drinking in the house, and a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners, and they're all dead. Where'd the wind come from, God or the devil? We still call it today, these things of destruction, acts of... He said, everything he has is in your power. Man's fallen. He's eaten the tree. He gave man the earth to subdue it, and man's being subdued because of the fall. And he's the prince of power there, the God of this world, the ruler of darkness. Where'd the fire come from? God or the devil? Where'd the wind come from? These catastrophes that kill and destroy innocent people, and we say it's the judgment of God? Shame on us. it's because our hearts are hard and we're not growing in love it's easy to project judgment love doesn't even think that way all of a sudden we're willing to give people what they deserve but we didn't get what we deserve All of a sudden, God, who's not partial, sovereignly has chosen to give an area some because we point out their sin when we've all fallen. We've all sinned. If I take a show of hands, how many have done wrong since they've known to do right? Every single person will raise their hand here. And God's mercy is beautiful and amazing. See, it's just too easy to say, well, that's a judgment of God, brother. That means our hearts are getting hard to the truth and the gospel and self-righteousness is creeping in and our view is distorted. Because Jesus died. No men deserve to be died. Die like that. Judgment is overridden by mercy. Where did the storm come from? God or the devil? Whose power was Job under? Didn't God say that? Is that in your Bible? Because I was reading it and I'm going, wow. But guess what they called it? The fire of God. Now watch, now his kids are dead, and Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, fell to the ground, and worshipped. It's amazing. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Did the Lord take away? Who took away? Guess what Job said? The Lord took away. Man, we sing song like that nowadays. We give and take away. We give and take away. My heart will choose to say, Blessed be your name. I didn't get the tune right. <laughs> blessed be the name of... I like that part. But every time we sing that give and take away, guess where I shift? You gave your son and took away my sin. You gave his life and gave me eternal life. You cursed sin on the cross and redeemed my life. You gave and took away. You gave and took away. (laughs) That's not what Job's saying. Job's only understanding is that God's sovereign and everything that happens is the will of God. There's no revelation of Satan in the Old Testament. So everything that happens is God and His will. 
And we've carried that into a new covenant, New Testament, even though Jesus came and shed the light on this whole thing. And said, the thief is here, steal and kill and destroy it. I've come to give you life and life even more. Mercy triumphs over judgment. The goodness of God turns men's hearts. He loves us. He's not hammering us. <laughs> They're only revelation. The fire of God fell. Consumed all your stuff. Job's a pretty integral fellow. He actually thought God did all this. And one cursing, because who am I to have the right? Who is the clay to curse the potter? I'm only here because of him. I can't be right and him wrong. And he worshiped God. And it says right there that he didn't wrong God in his heart. He didn't make, see, in all this Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. But guess what he charged him with? The act. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Let me ask you a serious question. Did the Lord take away? Who took away? What was the purpose? So that Job would express self-centered, self-serving commitment. And that he only loved God for his own sake. And that if God took away what he blessed him, he would no longer bless God. What Satan's trying to prove is that every man is selfish. Most adversity that comes to our lives has very little to do with us opening the door like we Christians say all the time. A lot of what happens is Satan doesn't believe we love God more than we love ourselves. He's convinced because he's watched thousands and thousands and thousands of people love their own lives. And he puts adversity on us and reveals because we preach the gospel that way. Pray this prayer and go to heaven. Pray this prayer and then God will meet your needs and bless your vats and fill your barns. Pray this prayer and your glassy seas and smooth waters will come and life will be easier now that you're saved. We teach the gospel, which is a formula and a principle by which to have a better, more convenient life. Some of the strength of our prayers through the day are just help the disposition of my boss. He's been acting like a jerk. Please make the car run better, and I hope I don't get stuck in traffic. God, yesterday was terrible. Where were you? This is real. It's demonic. We've preached it that way. We've preached the gospel that way. You know what God had me say in Ohio? In tears. I try not to cry. We've preached the gospel in such a way that there's a stronger stronghold of selfishness in the Christian than before he was a Christian. Because we got all these expectations now on God and we were promised the world by God. That's the way we preach it. And the conversion's all for us to go to heaven and to be blessed. That's why there's so many attitudes in the church. Disappointment, depression, fear, discouragement. That's why our countenances aren't so bright. I'm not being mean, I'm being real. Because we take account of suffers wrong, we take life personal, and we even subpoena God in our minds as if He hasn't blessed us. And we've made it about us. And that's got to stop. Because Satan has an easy field day there. I'll just squeeze them, and I'll find out what's really in them. Because when I squeeze them, Christ doesn't come out. And then he exposes our heart and accuses us before God. The only way scripturally to overcome that, the blood of the Lamb, the word of your testimony, and you love not your own life unto death. Oh. Lord, I can't believe you let that happen to me. Why, God? You, I thought you loved me. God, where's the grace in that? God, how come? Do you hear where our language goes right away? And it's accusing. And it's as if it's God. And it's the snake. He's a thief and he's sneaking through the grass, undisclosed, and he's pointing your heart to God. Well, if God really loved you, you'd never let the accident happen. Which well, is amazing. I thought God loved you and he was protecting you. Then how come you're like this? And look at your body now. And he said it'll never be the same. Look what happened to your spouse. Well, if God really loved you, why didn't he stop the accident? God's supposed to be for you. Sure, it doesn't seem like he's for you or the metal would have never crashed like that. <laughs> The whole reason adversity came here is that God revealed that there was something in this man that wasn't in any other man on the planet. And Satan said, yeah, right, he's the same. They're all the same. They all love themselves more than you. Watch, I'm going to prove it. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Wrong. The Lord gave and Satan attacked. And blessed be the name of the Lord, right? Watch this. Again, there was a day 
the sons of men, or the sons of God came to present themselves, and Satan came along to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said, from where do you come? And he said the same thing on the earth, walking back and forth. The Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, blameless, upright man who fears God and shuns evil and holds fast to his integrity, although you incite it in us? It's right here. When you squeeze an orange, you expect orange juice. It would be so weird if apple juice came out. But it's not weird when everything but Christ comes out of a Christian. And Satan has learned that. So that squeeze them people. He almost can't wait to hear your confession. So he can squeeze you a little. And accuse you before your God. And the only way you overcome, you love not your own life unto death. You render the blood and the word powerless on your behalf when you love yourself. When you ask amiss your own self, wow. And we've preached a very self-serving gospel, haven't we? See, I'm not a Christian to go to heaven. I'm a Christian to be right with God and walk with God and walk with the kingdom. I'm a Christian to be restored back to my original value and walk in the nature of God. I'm not a Christian for the perks and benefits of answered prayer. I'm a Christian to be right with God. I'm a Christian to take on his spirit and his nature and walk in love and release power. (laughs) It's very little to do with me. I got free from me 13 years ago. I said everywhere I go, I'm free from me. That makes me free from you. (laughs) When I got free from me, I got free from you. You can't own me anymore. Because I have no expectation on you. Joe, you just can't hurt me. You can't break my heart. Bob, you you can't break my heart because I have no expectation on you. We owe no man anything but to love. All of a sudden, people aren't our potter anymore. Because we're looking from heaven's view. All of a sudden, hurt, offense, and anger, frustration, bitterness, rightness, jealousy, pride, malice. We realize we were never made that way, created that way. We became that way through the fall. We put off the old and put on the new. All of a sudden, we're face to face with Daddy. And all of a sudden, his heart becomes our heart. Now we can manifest to him. There's so much more than going to church. It's being the church now. He touched him. He said, all that he has is in your hand, but you're not going to kill him. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Look, Satan went out. Who went out? And who struck Job with painful boils? Not the Lord. What was their discernment on it back then? That the Lord did all this. What was the truth behind the story? Satan was accusing the integrity of Job's heart and confession and faithfulness to God. And what he was trying to say is this, and take this very serious. What he's trying to say is, Men don't really love you for who you are. They only love you for what you can do for them. And if you're doing what they feel is right, they'll have a sense of covenant and relationship with you. But if they think you're not doing your part, they'll cut you off. Because men love themselves more than you, God. That's what he was saying. Man, that's a shame to me. That he would be that arrogant to say that to God. Because he knew knew the hearts of men. You remember Job was the only one on the earth like that. How many people do you think were on the earth at that time? And Job was the only one with that integrity. I'm going to get a little... It's going to get a little sticky for a minute, okay? You're going to be all right? You hold on tight, okay? How many discouraged Christians did you ever meet? It's because our eyes are on herself. It's because we're taking the hits personal. And we've lost heart and we've lost hope. And we're being deceived. I'm just okay talking like this. Discouragement's the epitome of me of deception. When the kingdom of God has come. If the eye is the lamp of the body and it's good and your body's filled with light, then there's something wrong with my view if I'm walking in despair. 
I'm telling you, it doesn't change the, in the face of losing a loved one, in the face of losing a job, in the face of it's time to respond in the Christ and in the truth, because that's where freedom is. If you respond in discouragement, it just keeps spiraling and spiraling till you're dry on the inside. And now you're going through the vain Christian motions of religion and works. I'm telling you, how many discouraged Christians have you met? I'm saying that in a little bit of a touchy way because there's folks sitting here right now like that. It's because we got our eyes on me instead of on who I am because of him. I know that's straight. That's how the gospel is. I'm not saying it to be right or me. I'm saying it because it needs said. I don't want to give myself permission to be less than what this gospel's paid the price for me to be. As my Bible says, if my eyes single and I'm looking through the king, I'm flooded with light. It doesn't say unless, of course, things ain't going your way. We think being a Christian is getting all your ducks in a row. My ducks are rarely in a row. I really don't even know if they line up. <laughs> <laughs> I can't tell you when my ducks have ever been in a row. But I can tell you Jesus is Lord. I can tell you that the joy doesn't come from the position of the ducks. Joy comes from your salvation Amen. and your face-to-face -face relationship with Papa. Amen. Joy comes knowing that you're right with Him and He loves you and His face is towards you. Yeah. <laughs> Joy comes from really learning and knowing greater is he in you than he that's in the world. And if you've been raised with Christ, get your mind off this earth and get it up there where he's seated. Think on things above, not the earth. I'm telling you, the self thing, it pulls you into realms and places. It's all a lie from hell. Watch this. It's not even who you are. It's who Satan's trying to deceive you to be, to live from that place because he knows the results. That's why we deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and follow Jesus. I don't even give myself and my feelings and emotions permission to have a pity party or feel sorry. I am so strong with myself on that regard. If I have a sympathy party, I'm the only one there. Come on. <laughs> or I draw to another sympathy-craving person and get them to pat me as I pat them. And we're no help for each other. It's a false, pitiful sense of comfort because it leaves us the same. I'm talking real straight stuff. Y'all sit and it's good. Nobody's running out or throwing nothing. At least he didn't throw. If you throw anything, throw the word. <laughs> just, uh, just don't throw rocks. Throw the Bible. <laughs> I can get hit by the word. I can take it. <laughs> don't throw rocks. Who brought rocks anyway? Nobody. <laughs> so all you have is a Bible. Throw a Bible if you want. No, this is convicting stuff. I am not a Christian for me. I'm a Christian for the glory of God and for people. I'm not a Christian for me. I'm a Christian for you. Do you get that? So come hell or high water, come adversity, and you squeeze, Christ should come flowing out. Isn't that the gospel? Submit to God. Resist the devil, he'll flee. We're so busy resisting and fighting the devil. What do you say we start submitting to God? Watch how weird this one is. This is a heavy. We intercede and we pray against the devil and bind and loose and rah, rah and shabah and all that stuff we do, right, against the devils. And then we turn around and live in the very attributes and nature of him and have no conviction of it and think it's normal. Very little power and effectualness in intercession when you're confronting darkness and embracing it. I think he chuckles at that stuff. And I don't like that. Because it makes us feel spiritual. Yeah, yeah. And we turn and leave without a conviction of the things in our life that are straight, raw flesh. Remember what Jesus said? He comes and has what? Nothing in me. That's amazing. I want that to be my life. I want that to be your life too. He comes and has nothing in me.
Don't be unaware of his devices. Can you hear Paul crying out? Don't be unaware of his devices and give him no place. He's an enemy. He's roaming around like a roaring lion. He's seeking whom he may devour. Give him no place. Resist him. Stand steadfast in the faith. This is a big deal what I'm talking about. Bottom line is this. One view will take you to love and the other view will take you to disappointment. And you'll lay down the gospel in the long run, some way, shape, or form. You'll lay it down. You know? And you'll find yourself going through the motions, being in the right place at the right time, disconnected because of a wrong view. I see it a lot. I travel a lot. I get to meet a lot of people. I've been blessed to be in a position where I've met a whole lot of folks and talked to a lot of people. My phone rings a lot. I get to talk to a lot of people. And I promise you, he's a deceiver. And counsel's not all that intense usually. It's not that complicated. It's usually people are being blindsided and deceived. And it's usually through areas they fail to give up or surrender or recognize aren't the kingdom. In their life. That's where you're vulnerable. What you hold on to is the pummeling point. What determines your joy is what gets struck. Wonder if it's him, he ain't getting struck. <laughs> Wonder if the gospel is really who you are. Oh my gosh, let's get it on forever, right? <laughs> See? Oh, oh, man. Ding. See, that clicks. <laughs> Wonder if that's your motivation. Wonder if there is a such thing as the pure in heart. Wonder if there is a such thing as will to do his will. What an untouchable place. Doesn't mean you won't go through stuff. What an untouchable place. Do you get what I'm saying? You're not for sale. You're not going to double take, double standard question. You're not going to do this. Your heart will be established. I've talked way, way, way long enough. I haven't been here for a while. I just had to catch up. It's been a long time. And I'm not going to be back for a while, really, unless I make it next week. I could possibly be here next week, but after that, it's going to be a long time. <laughs> I love it. Can we pray for the sick tonight? Would you all be willing to lay your hands on some sick folks? Do you believe the kingdom's in us? Do you believe it's his will to heal? Do you believe we have a yes and an amen? If you don't, we could take some time. I could show you in the Bible we got a yes and amen. It's Corinthians. The gospel's yes and amen. All the promises, by the way. Not some. They're all yes and they're all amen. So if you preach a gospel that says maybe he will, maybe he won't, Paul reveals in Corinthians that if that's your interpretation of the gospel, it's been derived from the flesh. He said, if I brought a gospel that was yes and no, or if I said I'd come to you and then I wasn't sure and didn't come to you, he said that would be to live by the flesh. No, I said yes, I'm here, and our gospel's yes, and it's here. What he's saying is a yes and no gospel was derived by the flesh. We've let our experience and our circumstance preach to us. And Matthew says, let your yes be yes and your no be anything else is of the evil one. We sure have preached a yes and no gospel, haven't we? Well, let's pray, brother. Who knows what God might do? Maybe he will, but if he doesn't, we'll have to learn to live with it. But let's go for it because who knows what God might do, brother? And we call that faith. We think because we pray, it's faith. No, because the mountain moved, it's faith. Faith is revealed in the mountain moving, not the prayer pray. Wow. So we say we see some mountains move tonight. Okay. I need you up here. If you got sickness, we're going to pray for you. Please don't leave this place if you've got sickness, if you're on medicines for stuff, if you've got arthritis, if you've got anything that's hindering your health and wholeness. We want to pray for you. Jesus is here. He's Lord. He's amazing. I'm telling you, he'll come and he'll move. So I need you up here. Anybody here, sickness in your body, come on. Get up front. We want to pray for you. He's amazing. We're going to turn the church loose. We're going to love you. It doesn't matter who prays for you. It matters that Jesus is here. 
It matters that Jesus is here. It's what matters. He's here. I found it in my Bible. Come on up. If you're sick in this place, please. Church, I want you to hang in there with me. If you can stay. Come up and let me Anybody else? You're sick in this place. You got any kind of sickness going on? Don't hold out.